Good morning, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here for the conclusion of the roundtable discussion. Reigning in spending, and uh, as I said before, this is you know when you go back to people like people like Peter Walsh, um, there is a Labor Party tradition as well of Peter like, Walsh, the former finance minister yeah. in the Hawke government. Go on. Yep. Uh, the, you know, the la Labor isn't necessarily, despite current um, uh, predilections, uh, necessarily wanting to overspend. Uh, I think good government is about constraining spending. Uh, can I also just make a point about um, uh, being back in the game? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how well your vote goes up in the seats that you hold. The, the battle for government in Australia is always about outer suburban, rural and regional seats. So if you can't win them, then you can't win government. Glenn, what's your sense of how this will all play out politically? Uh, I think there's some good uh, glimmerings of a way forward here that can break the vicious circle we've been caught in. Uh, and that's in this discussion, uh, sometimes it can be misleading, discussion over good and bad debt. If you get that right, you can talk about inclusive growth, because the circuit breaker is not just welfare for the disadvantaged, nor handouts to the, uh, the capitalists running the corporations. There really is a way forward in areas like education <coughs> and skills and workforce participation and early childhood development that help people uh, build their own lives effectively to avoid the need for so much support either way, so that you can have a flexible, talented, skilled, competitive uh, society. And the present budget is beginning to make noises in that area, but the investments in, uh, in, in reviving Gonski, we've got to see how that really works out. But the big areas like fixing up universities, fixing up TAFE and vocational education, fixing up early childhood education, and fixing up workforce situation, we're way behind the better, better country, the Scandinavians, the Canadians, and so on. Uh, if we can get that right, you've got inclusive growth where elderly folk and young people and kids in trouble <coughs> will be looked after so much better. And that means we can go forward uh, in ways that doesn't alienate and produce rust belts, but help solve the rust belt problem. Judy, what about this levy on the big banks across Macquarie? It was one of the, the most discussed parts of the budget. And it's not just the levy. There are other, some might say, highly interventionist measures that come with it. Um, and of course, the government now and the banks are at odds, or the big banks are. Um, how do you think this will play out? Is this just a, a done deal, a definite winner for the government? <coughs> well, I don't have that, but I, I thought it was also partly, you know, the fact that they're, the levies on the big banks, but not on the smaller banks, that it's be, partly because those banks have got this guarantee that was brought in after the um, global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's also to in, try to, in, by not putting it on the smaller banks, it's to try to increase a little bit of competition, bring a bit more competition into the banking sector. So, I mean, I think it also isn't that, uh, it, you know, like, so the shareholder's going to lose a little bit. I mean, it's really not, it doesn't strike me as being such a big impact. They should be able to absorb it into costs. I mean, they pay their senior executives yeah. um, something which to most ordinary Australians, it looks totally unjustified. Um, and I, I mean, I think I was talking about inequality before. The feeling when you look at these huge salaries, you look at the huge salaries of the Australian vice chancellors in our university sector, and then you've got to say, well, that, you know, they're the ones we know. And then the next, that, that will go down the executive, you know, f few layers down. And at the bottom, that, for example, in the universities, you've got them now relying on a casualised, underpaid workforce of highly trained and qualified people and I and so I think some of the anti-bank stuff is is about the sense that there's this overpaid elite at the top of some of our very powerful institutions and it's way out of kilter in terms of what seems to be morally justifiable. Finally Greg, I'll just, can, I, can I just make a comment yeah. about that? Um, the interesting thing, of course, is that one of the things that Gillard government did was to inflate the salaries of senior public servants and politicians. Mm. So the Labor Party uh, is also being guilty of uh, of perhaps overpaying its uh, its own, so to speak. Well, Glenn, the relationship between the two, between governments and banks, has always fluctuated. Is the current situation particularly bad in, in a historical context? 
Well, it will be you know, quite clearly with this measure. And in, in one sense, it's a populist measure that's trying to reach out to the, to the broad electorate by uh, showing that they, they will do something about the banks. The underlying question for an economist like me is, uh, uh, will that help and will it work? Well, ideally, you should do it to uh, all corporations that are making super profits, because essentially what this is, is a super profits tax, as we were going to apply to the, interestingly, to the mining industry before the mining campaign from the, uh, the Minerals Council. So uh, this is a resource rent tax, effectively, for a tightly held oligopoly that makes profits of the highest order, even around the, the world's banks. Our banks do better. So it's a super profits tax. Uh, we've dropped the, uh, uh, the, the, the debt recovery levy, and we've got a super profits tax on banks instead. In a sense, we picked the loser uh, rather than picking uh, across all those who are making uh, excess uh, excess revenue but it's a, it's again a step in the right direction but it is a little uh, discriminatory but it's uh, are going to be popular which i think is the basic reason for it alas that's all we have time for today thanks so much for your time thanks tom thanks tom there we go so a few things that they didn't actually get around to mentioning in the wake of uh Mal Gollum turning Bull's lightning visit to New Jersey to sit on a museum to the memory of when the Americans and the Australians had a much more mutually respectful relationship. Um, Turnbull, who drove a hard bargain in a telephone call back in February, March, um, succeeded in getting America to accept 800 Australian United Nations certified refugees from our concentration camps. And everybody wondered, what was the quid pro quo? They scratched our back with the refugees. Muslim refugees were politically poisoned to Donald Trump's electoral base. So what have we agreed to do for them? We're talking about going back into Absurdistan. The American general there wants another 3,000 soldiers. England's thinking about sending another 100 back to Afghanistan. This is 16 years the Americans have been trying to successfully occupy Afghanistan. Why did they want to occupy Afghanistan? Because a minor Saudi Arabian princeling called Usama bin Laden was staying there as a guest of the Taliban. Who was the Taliban? The Taliban was the United Nations recognized government of Afghanistan. How did they get to be the UN recognized government? The Americans trained, supplied, and paid them because they were part of the Mujahideen. And the Americans trained, paid, funded, supplied the Mujahideen because they were anti-Soviet. And it was very important to America back in the days when Kabul was run by a Soviet puppet regime. It was very, very, very important that that Soviet puppet regime should fall. So, yeah, they trained the Mujahideen. The Taliban were part of the Mujahideen. Al-Qaeda was part of the Mujahideen. The Saudi Arabian princeling was welcomed with open arms. He was on the front cover of Time magazine in America twice with his name spelt U-S-A-M-A, -A, Usama bin Laden, because USA was in his name, isn't it great? <clears throat> Why was it necessary to invade Absurdistan just because he was staying there as a guest of the Taliban? Well, you see, he was involved in rebelling against the King of Saudi Arabia because he found it intolerable that the King of Saudi Arabia had allowed 50,000 American troops to be stationed in Saudi Arabia. Now, the Americans thought this was cool because Nixon signed a deal with the King of Saudi Arabia which said that America guaranteed to provide for the military security of all the oil fields in OPEC. Right? For which OPEC pays in American dollars, which it generates by refusing to sell oil for anything but American dollars. So America's mercenary operation run by the pentagonal hemorrhoids effectively cuts a slice for America of every industrial deal that happens in the, the world unless you've got access to somebody who'll sell you oil for I don't know rubles or something well 
that's what happened to Libya, it's what happened to Iraq, it's what happened to Syria. You try and sell oil outside the system, you get jumped on by the Americans because they've agreed to fight whoever King Sword says is his enemy. And they get paid for it in American dollars. Okay, well, um, Osama bin Laden went to Absurdistan because the Russians were non-Muslims. He saw them as being infidels and he had to fight back against an infidel invasion of a Muslim homeland. So he saw 50,000 American troops in his own home country, Saudi Arabia, as utterly intolerable and he demanded they be removed. And when his King Sword said, shut up and be quiet, do as you're told, and the Americans said, go to buggery, we're going to stay there. He jumped up and down and he foamed at the mouth and, and he attacked the World Trade Center with a truck bomb. He sunk a destroyer tied up at a wharf. Uh, and then, remarkably, the three towers fell to the ground, neatly vertically deconstructed into their own footprint area at free fall speed because two of the towers were hit by two aeroplanes. And Osama bin Laden got blamed for that, sitting in a cave connected to a kidney dialysis machine hiding in the hills of Absurdistan. He planned that, apparently. So 16 fucking years later, Australia is still behaving like a pet attack train chihuahua. And now we're about to go back to Abs Absurdistan because it's convenient for Toronto Dump and Uncle Spam. Bah. Meanwhile, because people in Australia who work as um, train drivers, truck drivers, heavy equipment operators at mines, pilots, are subject to random drug testing because of the severe responsibility of them doing their job. As part of the budget, 5,000 people who are either on unemployment benefits or applying for unemployment benefits are to be subjected to drug testing. Either spit testing, urine testing, blood testing, or hair follicle testing for the unemployed because of the severe public risk of somebody coming home feeling crushed after a hard day not being able to find a job and, you know, like maybe sitting down and pulling a few cones. Apparently, the areas that are going to be randomly tested are not quite so random because what they've done already is they've gone around and they've tested the sewage works for the drug content of what gets pumped from the towns into the sewers. So they know what parts of Australia are consuming what drugs and how much of them, and they're going to go there and subject the unemployed to those tests. <sighs> Apparently because uh, New Zealand tried this and it had more or less zero effect, it did no good and it didn't prevent anybody, it didn't help anybody. Therefore, in an absolute absence of any scientific evidence to suggest it's a good idea, our prime muppet, Mal Gollum, evil zombie made out of clay by a Jewish mythological magician, Mal Gollum, has decided that it's a common sense thing, that we need to randomly drug test the unemployed. Oh, and anybody who's on a disability pension purely because of their drug problem, they're to be put back on the dole, and anybody who tests positive is going to be, uh, they're going to have their income managed. So they're only going to be able to get 20% of their dole or whatever it is in cash anyway. So vast numbers of fucked up people who can't get a job are now going to be monstered. And I can only imagine that the homeless rate and the suicide rate are going to fucking skyrocket. It's make war on the young, the poor, the homeless, the unemployed, the aborigines, anybody who you think you're superior to, put the fucking boot into because you're a white Australian liberal, national, desperate to tr try and recover the One Nation vote. Because all One Nation wants to do is fucking make Australia white again, just like it was in the 1950s and 60s. That's their plan. <sighs> and because we've got to have wars, otherwise there'd be nobody to march at Anzac Day, we're going back to Absurdistan. I wonder how much longer it's going to get worse. I really do. But anyway, I figure all the little Trumpletons will be trampled on because global warming is not bullshit. The climate science is not left-wing liberal lies and, and it's not a conspiracy by the Chinese to depress the American market. 
you can't have any economic activity unless you've got an environmental surplus and every fucking environmental surplus on the face of the planet has been consumed. So now we have to have less economic activity. You cannot grow a shrinking economy. Well, I'd like the YouTube. Take it easy. Ciao.